Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Blueberry Pediatrics Podcast. I'm here with Monica Davern, Dr. Monica Davern, one of our amazing pediatricians at Blueberry Pediatrics. She also is the owner of MightyRoots.org and an Instagram at MightyRoots, where she talks, I'm sorry, is there a dot in there? At Mighty.Roots. Yeah. Yeah. And where she talks all about um, picky eaters, baby led weaning, plant-based eating, uh, so much to dive into. Dr. Monica Davern is a vegan pediatrician and plant-based boy mom living in Denver, Colorado. She created Mighty Roots, an online resource for parents with kids of all ages interested in improving health and wellness through food and family connection. As an advocate for prevention and childhood wellness, Dr. Davern helps families find better health through plant-based nutrition and joy at mealtimes. Her online program, Leafy Littles, is designed specifically for busy families interested in getting more plants on the plate with fewer power struggles. All of her resources can be found at MightyRoots.org. She is also on Instagram, at MightyRoots, at Mighty.Roots. Welcome, and thank you for joining. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, I love your content, and I think there's so much to take away from it and so much to dive into. So let's break this down and start with uh, baby led weaning and introducing solids and all the fun around that. Yeah, that sounds great. So I think you know, introduction of solids is sort of like one of those parenting moments, like similar to when you're about to take your baby, your first baby home from the hospital and the nurse just like hands them to you. And you're like, wait, you're just, you're just going to let me like take them home now. You're You're like, like, this is mine. They're like looking at you. Yes, you're going to do this now. And you're kind of like, okay. Um, it's kind of similar, right? Like you don't really know what you're doing. You know, I'm supposed to just start feeding my baby. What am I going to feed them? What if it's a total disaster? What if they choke? What if all these things? So I think it's a moment where Parents need a lot of reassurance and maybe just a little bit of guidance to feel like they're doing it right. So I think it's, you know, historically, introduction of solids has been, you know, this introduction of pureed foods where you're opening up a jar of baby food, taking out a spoon, whether or not your baby's really ready, kind of forcing them or not forcing them and just kind of seeing how it goes. And I think that that is sort of going by the wayside now that people are into this concept of baby led weaning, which is really, in principle, just allowing your kid to kind of be in charge of when they're ready, how much they're going to have, what they're going to eat, fostering these independent eating habits as opposed to just sort of spoon feeding them and assuming that they're going to pick up these skills along the way. So can I ask you a question about something you said, like the image of starting baby food, you open a jar. So you bought food and it's like shelf sustainable and we're feeding our kids out. Like, why are we here? Yeah. I honestly don't know. I know. I think that's a really great question because I think For so long, motherhood was about convenience. And I think that my mom too was raised in an era where like everything in the kitchen was all about convenience. Like how quickly can we get this done? What are we going to do to feed everybody cheaply and, you know, efficiently? And I think that that is sort of a concept that people are kind of not really into anymore necessarily. Like I think a lot of the people in this generation of parenting are really more into doing things themselves and like making their own baby food and things like that. But um, baby led weaning also traditionally has been thought of of not purees. So some people think, okay, I'm either going to do purees, which means I'm going to mash up a bunch of stuff myself or buy it, or they're going to like, you know, do baby led weaning, which is more like soft foods that your kid can pick up and do on their own. So I think the first thing to remember is that number one, you really don't have to buy anything in particular in order to feed your baby. I think a lot of, you know, parents are sort of victims of this culture of what do I need in order to do this right? Well, you don't really need anything necessarily. Um, except for the foods that you're already going to make for the rest of your family. And maybe if you're going to invest in something, invest in a really good, safe, ergonomic high chair for your baby. So we can talk about all that stuff too. But I think, you know, before you even get to that point, it's really great to talk about when your baby's ready. Um, And from a pediatrics perspective, I think this is a great question. It's definitely something we get a lot at Blueberry um, is when is my kid ready and what do I do next? So so before we go into that, let me just go back a little bit too, because So I, just so everyone knows where my mentality is, I love this idea of baby led weaning. It's one theory of like introducing to solids that a lot of people have had success with. It's not the only way to do it. And sure, if you need convenience and to buy stuff from off the, off the shelf, like that's great, whatever works for your family. I think when you want to dive into what's the most nutritious and how can I do this differently? And then it doesn't have to be that way if you want it to be different, that we can, uh, this is how you learn how to do that and build from there. And it's, it, I think it's, it's hard because of all these preconceived notions that we have, but exactly what you're saying is to like, 
it doesn't have to be so hard that we can all do it without so much work going into it um, is also key here. Uh, I will tell yeah. you from experience, I did not do complete baby led weaning. I think there's so many aspects of it that are wonderful. There's also some that you or I may not agree with, like anyone out there listening. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I would say like maybe one other thing, if you're wanting to um, add in to trying baby led weaning is um, if you want to puree a little bit, be able to yeah. as you're getting comfortable. Exactly. So let's go, yeah, let's go from yeah, there. Yeah, we'll so get into that. And full disclosure, like I think the, what I'm going to tell you is exactly what you're saying, Lindsay, where I really recommend kind of a hybrid of both. So some people are super into baby led weaning and they don't want their kid doing anything with purees and that is completely fine. I support that. But I think for most people, there is a role for purees and we're going to kind of talk about that too. But I think when we right. talk about baby led weaning, what I mean is allowing your baby to tell you that they're ready, that they're interested, and when they've had enough. And I think those are sort of the three things to me that are really important, no matter what approach you take, is to really allow your kid to be the one that's telling you how it's going. Because the goal is to foster like solid mealtime dynamics for the rest of your life. Okay, And I don't want any power struggles. I want you guys to be on the same page and just have everybody enjoying. And you know that's what mealtimes are really all about. It's not so much about the food on your plate or what you're doing, it's really about sitting and connecting as a family. So is yeah, that like let's a get into it. Goal? <laughs> it sounds so I fun. think it is. I think okay, so. Awesome. I mean, this is the way that I frame this for people. So like if you sat down at the table, let's say you went on a date with someone, it doesn't really matter who it is. Maybe it's a first date. Maybe it's, a, maybe let's just say it's a first date because this is your kids that are, you know, sitting down for the first time trying food. If your person that you're out there with is like, telling you that you can't have more bread if the server comes by, you're not going to order dessert, and why haven't you eaten any of your peas? Like, you're just going to be really annoyed and kind of freaked out, and it's really awkward. Like, you probably would never go on a first date with that person again. And if you did, you would probably sit down thinking like, oh, I know how this is going to go. They're going to comment on everything I'm doing. They're Like, instead of just focusing on connection and, like, really talking about something else, right? So the food is sort of the vehicle to get you there. Um, and I think just kind of shifting your thinking about it can really help like from a parenting perspective on this. So absolutely. So I think that's the key is like, it's about our perspective as a parent going into it to be able to achieve that goal. I don't know, for me, it seems so hard even now, maybe I've been doing it wrong with my kids, but um, it's nah. tough. It's really tough for everybody. I think that's why it's such an interest, a field of interest for parents. Mm -hmm. And that's actually like kind of the backstory, like why all of this came to be was that so my husband and I have been vegan a long time. So we, you know, went plant-based like nine years ago now, actually. Um, we were living in the Bay Area. It's the easiest thing in the world to be plant-based out there. There's so many options, you know, everything is available year round. And like for our athletics and stuff, it was so easy and so great. And then even as a pediatrician, like I had a baby that was really picky and that wasn't growing. And so mealtimes like really just brought me to my knees. Like I would cry, like the thought of having to feed him to help him gain weight was just really overwhelming you know, it was like a nuclear meltdown from not just him, but also for me. And um, it really made me question because by then this had been like such a value for both of us. I mean, we've been doing it for like four or five years already. And um, I kind of thought like, why? I should know what I'm doing. Like I'm a pediatrician and I am like a very experienced plant-based person. Why won't he grow and why won't he eat? And that was sort of what made me kind of really take a deep dive into all this stuff. Like, how can I make this easier and how can this be fun? And so that's kind of why I created all this is just sharing everything that I've learned kind of out of that process. So, yeah, that's great. But plus you're a pediatrician, let's not downplay that. So like, you know, have all the yeah. knowledge behind, you know, all the nutrition that has to get in on top of the pickiness. So yeah, I'd love yeah. to hear how you navigated that. That is really tough. Yeah, it was really tough, but I think like the backing off is really what matters the most. Like I think, especially parents that are getting ready to start this process, like my first recommendation is, you know, the, and just out of all my experience with families, like in primary care and, you know, all my experience with friends and family, the kids that are really allowed to have the most autonomy and the less interference as they're learning how to eat, like those kids do the best and they end up being the easiest to feed long term. So my number one recommendation is like, as you're starting this process, like, please say yes to the mess make sure it's okay with you. Like you can set up an environment. We can kind of get into logistics. Like, you know, you're going to put the kid in a high chair, you're going to put a sheet underneath and you're going to put them in whatever. Like for me, that ended up being just getting my kid mostly naked so that I could just wipe them off when it was done. I didn't have any laundry to do or anything. 
Um, being okay with the fact like, yes, this is going to be messy, at least in the beginning while they are learning this skill and then do your best to really not intervene. Like don't wipe them till they're done. Don't take their spoon away. Just allow them to kind of like be there and enjoy and get this going. I think the easiest thing to remember is that like learning how to eat is a skill and just like anything else that we have to learn. If somebody is constantly interrupting you and correcting you and telling you to do it a different way, like you, you get really frustrated with that and you don't really even want to try anymore after a while. Right? So I think rule number one, allow your kid to just really learn this on their own and try not to intervene as much as you can um, to really allow them to just explore and start to enjoy the process to make it as pleasant as possible. So, And this starts from when, what ages do you usually recommend? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we can kind of get into that. So when are babies ready to start to eat solids? Um, so I think this has gotten a little bit muddy because there was some data that came out not that long ago about how early introduction of allergens is beneficial for babies. Um, and I think that's sort of the message that most pediatricians got. That's sort of the message that gets repeated over and over. But the truth of the matter is that the data behind that is actually not very clear. And so my recommendation is to really wait until your kid is showing the signs of readiness, which is usually around six months of age. And if you had a preterm baby, that means six months corrected gestational age. So the data behind early introduction of solids was actually specifically looking at peanut allergy. So the introduction of peanut between ages four and six months of age showed to be beneficial, but only in kids that already had a known egg allergy or who were prone to allergies for some other reason, like for family history or some other issue. Um, and so in those kids, like, yes, there was some benefit to starting allergy exposures early, um, but it was really specific to peanut. And so I think you kind of have to look at the, the risk benefit ratio, just like in anything else in medicine where, okay, my kid is six months, but they're not ready really. Like they haven't shown me all the signs that we're going to talk about. Um, is it better to wait or should I just go ahead and do it? Because I know that this data around the allergens, like, no, I think the, the answer is to always just wait, just wait till your kid is fully ready because that's the safest thing to do. So like for food in general. Yeah. So saying. food in general, let's say six months. So I would say six months and they have to be able to like sit up more or less unassisted. So if your kid is still like really struggling to just like hold their core posture, they flop over still, they're not quite ready. They really do have to be able to more or less sit up on their own. Um, and all of this is because they have to be able to use their core to support like a safe swallow. So if they start to gag on food, which is completely normal, um, they have to be able to like engage their core stick their feet down and then like spit the food out of their mouth. So if they're still sort of like flopping around and not completely in control, it's probably not the safest thing to start them on solids. You probably should wait a little bit longer so that they can, you know, do it with a protected airway, which is what we really like to see always. So obviously. here's like a, I guess a controver controversial question about it. So like say your kid is six months. And so like the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends four to six months because every baby develops differently. Some may, yeah. be, may reach those milestones at an earlier age than others. Yeah. And really, like you said, we're starting with just the basics. So like it's the sensory. It's like a tiny mm -hmm. little taste. It's holding something yeah. in your hand, putting it to the mouth. All right. So something a little controversial is like if we wait till six months and we really want them to have those core strength muscle developed, which some for some babies can be earlier could be as early mm -hmm. as four the american academy of pediatric recommends starting feeding four to six months and at that point we're only talking about little sensory things like they're holding mm -hmm. something they're learning how to put it to mouth they taste something so yeah. if what about you know if they're starting purees so this is like the controversial part so maybe if mm. they start purees you don't risk that choking and you get to expose yeah. them to the sensory a little earlier not yeah, absolutely. But I know that that's probably the argument I did. Like, I found a blog post or an Instagram post, and I got like backlash that I said as early as four months when people wanted, you know, to see more. Yeah, like six month advocate advocate. Yeah. Well, I think like it's just like anything. I mean, it really is going to come down to the baby, right? Like, is the baby ready? I mean, my youngest walked at nine months. Like, I don't know anybody else that did that. He's like baby Hercules. That's my impressive. oldest will wait as long as possible to do anything. So they're just different kids, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think it just depends. I think the the best thing to do if you're really trying to foster independence and just enjoyment around food is again to just like listen to your baby. I think there's a big difference between taking a scoop of purees and kind of like force feeding a kid versus like, okay, I'm going to mash up a banana or I'm going to buy some baby food, whatever. And I'm just going to like, let my kids smell it really quick. And I'm going to hold the spoon closed and I'm just going to see if they 
you know, stick their tongue out and do this. And if they do that and I put a little bit on there, what do they do next? Do they enjoy it? Do they hate it? Do they start crying? Are they telling me to stop? Are they telling me that they're having fun and I should do it again? Like really just listening, I think is the most important like part of all of this. And so, um, yeah, I think as long as your kid is showing that they're ready, they're interested, those are the other requirements, right? So like they can, they're more or less six months old. They're more or less able to sit up. They have more or less good head control that they can actually like, you know, sit at the table or sit somewhere where you can, yeah, you know, get them, them to like participate. Flopping. Yeah, where they're not going to just yeah. like land in the yeah. in the can of beans <laughs> or whatever it is. They have to hold their yeah. hands. Yeah, yeah. And then are they interested in it? Like some babies come out like ready to just grab your sandwich and try it. And other babies are so not food motivated. So I think it really just sort of like reading all of these cues and deciding like when you're ready to try. How you want to read them. Your like the, what you described, the, the taste, the spoon, the touch, like that's like mm-hmm. 95% of introducing foods is that part, not like them yeah. swallowing it. It's like really the, this yes. is what introduction is about. Yes, exactly. And that's actually where the purees are helpful because I think the more we back off, like if we approach this from a perspective of like, okay, I'm going to just let my baby be in charge. I'm going to offer what I have to offer because remember up until six months, they really do not need anything else nutritionally. And that's why that's another reason we don't really recommend any solids before six months is because they're completely fine on infant milk, which is like breast milk or formula. Um, but after six months, they're still pretty much good to go with just breast milk or formula until they're about one. And so all of this is really just for fun. However, if you have a baby that's like really struggling to gain weight and you're hoping that the solids are going to help with that, then purees are actually sort of a better thing to rely on. Like I would lean more into purees in that situation. And the reason is that with the, what we talk about, like quote, baby led weaning, with soft foods or avocado, banana, sweet potato that's been cooked, things like that. Anything that's about as big as your pinky finger um, that you can smush between your fingers is sort of the, that's what we're talking about for traditional baby led weaning. Um, Those type of foods are great for helping the kid practice picking it up off a tray and sticking it in their mouth and maybe practicing to chew a little bit. But around six months is when they finally lose this reflex where they're just going to like spit everything out no matter what. And so the purees are actually a lot more likely to actually go in. So if you're working on calories for whatever reason, like the purees can be helpful because they're much more likely to actually swallow some of those. Whereas like these baby led weaning foods tend to be kind of all or nothing. And at the beginning, it's going to be mostly nothing, you know, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So then what, what do you recommend in terms of like which foods you choose for baby led weaning? How do you break it down? Size? Let's talk about all that. How, what do you like? Okay. If I was a mom and like, what would you tell me to get started? Yeah. So I say, again, like my point of view is that I want this to be as simple and enjoyable for everybody as possible. So I would recommend starting with the foods that you're already making for everybody else. Like my principle is that I don't want these moms out there trying to be a short order cook where you make this really nice little baby plate for your kids and then a, you know, a separate, like really fancy, beautiful meal for you and your partner. Like that's just not a sustainable way of approaching this. In my opinion, I would rather just have you make one thing for everybody and you can modify it slightly for the younger kids in your house. So like, let's say you're making, I don't know, what are you going to make tonight for dinner, Lindsay? Maybe you're ordering, I don't know. Is it Tuesday? Is it Monday? It's Monday. It's Taco Monday. (laughs) Okay, Taco Monday. Okay, so to our house, that would mean like some sweet potato, probably some like chopped up tofu cubes in the air fryer, probably some black beans, some guacamole, um, whatever else. Maybe like some, for us, it'd be like vegan cheese and, you know, tortillas. Um, So maybe for a different family, that looks different. But you could probably think of what you're going to be putting on your tacos. So it like just as an example, so what you would want to do then, so for me, I would probably dice up a bunch of sweet potatoes for everybody. But if I was feeding a baby, I would want that little strip of the potato wedge to be about as big as my pinky finger. And then I would want to cook it until it was soft enough that I could just squish it between my fingers. So that would be like something easy for them to hold and pick up on their own. Again, like they're still working on that pincer grasp around this time by now. Most of them don't have it. So you want to put it on something like in a bowl or a plate with edges so that they're not going to like just knock it onto the floor as they're trying to scoop it up. But something like that. Or you could do like some guacamole mashed up, like put it right on the high chair let them get crazy. It's all good. Um, things like that. So I don't know if that gives you a sense, but you know, not too small. So they're not going to choke on it and just soft enough that they can kind of smush it and turn it into a puree on their own. Okay. So this is, um, 
this like gives me like helps me to breathe a little because I'm on the more antsy side and nervous about choking uh, and take all. Yeah, I know everyone takes all precautions, but I will just be like very slow and in, in like taking the next step. But what you described is almost like them allow, allowing them to puree it and play with it in the hands. These are all squishy things for the most part. Because I've seen people where it's like, handed my kid a chicken leg and let him go at it. That's all. Yep. People are doing that. Hand. People do that, right? Or like, mm-hmm. how do you feel about that? Yeah. Well, there's also a bunch of theories out there about that. So people are saying like, well, for full jaw development, like there's, I don't know if you've heard about this, but like there's a lot of... Um, talk about how kids anymore don't get the full jaw development because they eat mushy foods for so many years and they're so picky and they'll have just pasta with math, like mushy stuff. And mm-hmm. so we, that they heard. think that we should be like giving kids a chicken wing to just chew on and kind of practice using the back of their mouth. Which like, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I would say like, that's where I draw the line on my scope of expertise. Like, I'm not really sure if that's necessarily a thing. And I definitely am not familiar with the data about that. But, um, but yes, there is a school of thought that learning how to chew on like these hard and crunchy foods is really important for jaw development. So I think if that's the way that you feel and you feel strongly about that, that's fine. Um, Just make sure you're offering foods that are not choking hazards. Right. So I think that's where it's so confusing because is that not we're having chicken for dinner tonight and yes, there might be a mushy vegetable, but like, am I putting pieces mm-hmm. of chicken in, on the plate for my six, seven month old? I mean, I'm not, so it's hard for me to say, but I, I oh, think sorry. like as long that's as like it's soft, that's okay. No. Based. Well, I think like, let's just say like if there are vegans listening to this, like let's just use this as an example. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to get canceled, but I don't want to, I don't want to make anybody mad, but I would say as long as you've like boiled it and it's as soft as possible that your kid can essentially turn it into a puree when they squish it between their fingers, put it in their hand and stick it in their mouth. It's probably fine. Um, so I would say, you know, like anything that's soft enough that you can smash it is perfect for baby led weaning, you know, and even things that, you know, are not going to break. Like I would say, like things that are not going to break into a million little pieces are probably fine for your kid to chew on as well for the, just the sake of that jaw development and the practice. Like you could give your kid a giant carrot stick most likely. And if they don't have any teeth, there's no way that it's going to break off into a size that's going to choke them. Like they could probably just chew on it, like have a little bit of sensory, you know, hang out, see what it's like. I think all of that is completely fine. Like they're um, gnawing on so, it, but nothing's being yeah, off where they can show up. Right, exactly. It. Yeah. Basically, it's really important for people to know what to expect when they're going to feed their baby for the first time. So you should expect some gagging. And gagging, what is that? Well, it's like a totally normal reflex that your kids are going to do more than likely on the first time that they try and eat something. It's a reflex that's going to protect the airway. It's loud. It's not pretty. They might gurgle and spit. They might just like kind of toss everything out of their mouth. And as a parent, it's really going to freak you out because you're like, okay, my kid just turned red and spat out everything but that's actually not choking so if they're turning red and making noise they're gagging and it's all good they're going to take care of their airway your job is to stay calm do not freak them out do not panic because if you do then that gag can can turn into so choking is actually silent and instead of turning red or purple your kid will turn blue and so it's really important for you to be there and to sit and watch and see exactly what they're doing but really try and like check yourself and not panic at the same time and of course, if you're suspecting choking, then turn them over on their back, give some back blows, call 911, do what you need to do. But most of the time, that gag reflex is actually really strong. And so that's what's going to kick in and protect their airway, you know, more than nine times out of 10, I would say. Yeah. So the gagging is what you want them to do because they're going to protect the food from going down the wrong pipe into their airway. And while you're watching it, I think what you said is so true. They're feeding off of your emotion and they're already a little worked up. You got to take a moment and just say, like, is this gagging or is this choking? Choking, obviously, huge emergency, but gagging not. And so let them work it out. Mm-hmm. And for choking, you, you know, you start the like the infant. Um, uh, infant CPR. CPR. I mean, uh, yeah. In, yeah, you but, have a whole podcast yeah, on that. So we can refer people yeah, to that we'll, episode. That, we'll refer to that. For, yeah. yeah, for that <laughs> yeah refer one. to but that episode. For, like, for, or- for gagging, though, you don't want to hit them on the back. <laughs> And I think people do as an instinct, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So people need to think about gagging. Like gagging is to feeding your kid as falling is to learning how to walk. Like gagging is going to happen. It is par for the course. It's normal. Um, And also gagging doesn't necessarily mean that your kid doesn't like the food that you gave them. It's just their 
refle- it's a reflex that they're really not in control of doing. They're just going to do it to protect their airway. So the other important thing to keep in mind is that like if you offer something to your kid one time and they gag and spit it out or they make a really weird face or you just assume that they don't like it, you actually need to just keep trying. So there's data to say that really kids don't decide whether or not they like a food until they've been exposed to it something like 20 times or more. So just don't give up. Like variety is key. You know, keep offering those foods. If your family is really into a certain type of food because it's part of your culture, it's part of what you do every single night of the week, then just keep offering it and eventually they're going to try it and eventually it will go down. There's something like 32 steps total to eating at all. So this is something I love to talk about. Like if you remember back to when you were pregnant last time and you would like walk into a room and it was just not your day to be in the room with food, how like you had this just big visceral response to being around food. Like that's actually the first step of eating is just being present in a room where food is being cooked or where it's being eaten by other people. So like I think people need to kind of reevaluate their idea of success when it comes to feeding their kids too, because just because your kid isn't going to try something or it's, they're ignoring it on their plate actually doesn't mean that they're never going to eat it. It's actually a pretty, it means they're actually pretty close to trying it, you know? Yeah, I think picky eating, it's like a separate category for all the ages, but to keep reintroducing, even if at, like even, for babies, we're talking about getting used to something. And I, it's my personal belief that the earlier you introduce it, the more likelihood you'll have for success because you're just going to do it more. Mm-hmm. They're less opinionated. They're less, um, mm-hmm. they're putting less associations with things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, but when they're like four and they decide they hate salmon. And then, sorry, mm-hmm. I keep choosing non plant You can pick salmon. No, it's Let's okay. Play. All right. Um, like, that doesn't mean you're done. That means maybe give mm-hmm. it a few months and try it again. We, we sometimes call it pink chicken <laughs> in my house. Because that goes <laughs> over way better than salmon. That's awesome. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Uh, but, like, I think the conti- you just have to keep trying because there's, there's no one no, that's it. It's done. It's on a continuum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. So let's talk about the allergens. I, th- I think we we does, we owe that a little extra, like d- click and double down on. Yeah, uh, I had totally. we did a um, we did a like a social media post where we saw a family doing introducing peanut butter at the doctor's office outside, and I have friends who have done this. I couldn't believe it. It's like a real mm-hmm. thing. So it's because yep. there's a real fear that you know, your kids are going to go into, go into anaphylaxis and like need emergency care. So the overwhelming majority are not going to, that's not going to happen. But so we're saying introduction at around six months should be good. And what, like, how do you recommend going about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, peanut butter is like a total staple at our house. So I can't imagine what I would do if my kids were allergic to it, but I think the best way to introduce it, you know, at this, at six months, it's tough because they're not really ready for like a nut butter. So I really like to lean into like the peanut butter powders because you can mix them with water. So like that PB2 powder, which is, you know, it's just like powdered peanut butter and you just mix it up with water. You can make it really thin and really runny and you can just kind of like drizzle it over a food that they've already had, like banana or something like that or applesauce and just kind of mix it in. And as long as, you know, they've been exposed to the food before it. So if you're going to pair it with something, you can just make sure it's a food that they're already tolerating. And then try and drizzle it on or incorporate it, you know, frequently. They say early and often is really good. So um, I like the nut butters. And I think they probably make them for other um, other allergens as well, like other tree nuts. Um, and I think they do make like even packaged ones for some of those tree nuts that are just thinner that you can use, you know, in the same way. Um, all okay. right. So we, we got the powder, then the butters, and then there's a risk with the actual nuts, isn't there? Like the well, you want to, you want, yeah. I mean, you want your kid to be able to like chew them effectively. Like my, you know, I give my four year old some nuts sometimes. He doesn't really like them, but he'll eat them. My two and a half year old wants them, and I'm terrified every time. So I, I honestly would recommend just waiting on the actual nut. I mean, you're gonna get that allergen exposure out of the powder anyways, um, because it's really like the protein that is the allergen. It's not so much like the oil and the fat. And that's what, that's the difference. So like these nut powders are really helpful because they're just sort of like the distilled nut protein um, without all the oil and fat. And so you're still going to get the benefit of the allergen exposure if you just use like the powder and mix it with some water and drizzle it on. So what's the difference if you like mix powder kind of becomes a pasty butter-like 
consistency? Like what's the, yeah. why do you prefer that? Yeah, you can just make it a little thinner. Like I think sometimes peanut butter itself is so thick and like mm. it's just hard. Like, you know, if you eat a bite of peanut butter sandwich and you take too big of a bite, you can like feel it go all the way down because it's thick. I mean, it really doesn't, doesn't, it's not as forgiving as like a thin nut butter that you can just kind of drizzle or mix into something, you know? Does that okay. make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, totally. And then what yeah. about eggs and other potential allergen? Yeah. So I think you can expose them as you're ready. I mean, I think obviously like scrambled eggs or something like that are, you know, great. They're easy for kids to grip, to smush, to get into their mouth. I think we get into trouble when we forget about variety. And so I think the the most important thing in like preventing allergies is a huge exposure to a variety of foods. So um, like, it's great if people want to introduce egg, you can do it in a baked form or, or like a cooked form. I think that's fine. Um, full disclosure, I never did that with my kids and they're not allergic to anything. So if you are a person that's like, I don't like eggs or your other kid has an allergy to eggs and you aren't able to expose your child or don't want to, it's okay. They're going to get that exposure anyway, eventually. Like my kids go to birthday parties and they stick a cupcake in their mouth or they want to try a piece of chicken or whatever. And they're completely fine. I think the reason is that they've had a lot of exposure to a lot of variety. And I think we do get into trouble when we kind of lean on a handful of foods only. And that's when we actually are prone to get more allergies. So exposure early and often to a variety of foods is really the key. Um, And you can do it at any time as long as your kid is showing the other signs of readiness. So as long as it's not a choking hazard, they're stable enough, they're going to protect their airway, like you can really offer them some version of whatever you're feeding the rest of the family, as long as it's a safe, like safe for them to, to try, you know? Yeah. Gotcha. So then in terms of the pickiness, so that all makes sense for the allergies. I think we got that down for picky eaters. This is something I, I think we all struggle with and it's Mm -hmm. a really frustrating part of raising a kid, at least for me. Um, and, mm-hmm. and especially because of the landscape that we live in, where there's just so much around with like, that's carb heavy, that's sugar heavy, and mm-hmm. they just narrow, they narrow down what they choose to eat because of what's presented mm-hmm. to them. So especially yes. when you're doing plant-based with your kids, can you give me insight into like how you do this successfully? Just, it seems so yeah. hard. So it's actually not as hard as you would expect. I mean, like once you kind of figure out what to do and you kind of have a formula for it, it gets a lot easier. So kind of the thing, the crux of what I teach in my online program, Leafy Littles, is actually like how to prepare a kid's plate as sort of a framework for what you're going to make for your whole family, what you're going to offer. So I generally say you're going to start with one familiar food And that's something that they like that they're already eating. So that can be anything. It can be a processed food or not. But the rule is that you're going to put three different things on their plate and you have to be okay with them eating any of those three in any order and in any amount. So if you aren't cool with it, like if you don't want them to have a cupcake for dinner, you're not going to put a cupcake on the plate. Okay. If you're okay with them eating like some Ritz crackers and maybe that's their dinner, if you pair it with two other things. I'm like, okay, you can put the Ritz crackers on the plate. So one familiar food. And then the second one is a fresh fruit, a a fresh food. So I would also make this something familiar that they're already eating that they already like. So maybe let's say, okay, we went with Ritz crackers as choice number one. Choice number two is maybe something like sliced, sliced strawberries or hummus, or maybe it's green peas, or maybe it's peaches, something that your kid already likes and knows that they're going to eat for sure. And they might not eat it first, but maybe they'll get there. Like they'll start with the Ritz crackers and they're going to make their way and maybe try some of whatever the fresh food is. And then the third one is a variation of whatever the rest of the family is eating. So if it's taco night at your house, you're going to take some guacamole on a tortilla and wrap it up and stick it on their plate. And maybe that's where you start, right? Like something super simple that you think is going to be like at least approachable for them that like once they're done with the other two things that you know they're going to try, they're going to like get used to expecting something unexpected on their plate. And eventually they're going to get used to trying it. So that's kind of the approach that I take. And I think that works because, you know, number one, I don't want people to have to be a short order cook where they're making chicken nuggets five nights a week for their kids while they're also making this huge ordeal dinner for the rest of their family. Like you want your kids to eventually start to eat whatever everybody else is eating. And so that's kind of the way that I tell people to try. So it's like a gateway food. 
Like mm-hmm. put the gateway yes. food that you know they're going to like to open it up yep. for the other stuff. Um, yeah, because okay, if you have a picky eater, they struggle with the pr- like getting the process started. So like a picky eater is going to sit there and be like, I'm not doing this. I don't like this. I'm not into this. And so you have to give them something like where you can meet them where they are so that they can at least initiate the process of starting to eat. And eating always begets more eating. So, you know, like if you don't want those chips and, and salsa, like don't have the first one because you know you're going to keep eating them, right? It's the same for kids. Yeah. And what about, yeah. like, for me, I, I know that I would think, okay, the Ritz crackers are there, the fruit's there, and then the the protein-packed, whatever the family's eating is there, and the kid touches none of that and, like, pounds the Ritz crackers and then says, oh, you know, I'm good. Time for dessert. Mm-hmm. Like, that's yeah. that's tough. That I could see that happening. I think so. But I think you also have to remember that, like, if that happens – you have to kind of remember like those other foods on their plate. If you think of the total of there's 32 steps from being around food to putting it in your mouth and swallowing it, they're actually super, super close. Like if they're not flinging it across the room or they're not like throwing a huge tantrum that there's a slice of strawberries on their plate, it means they're like this close to actually eating it. They're so close that like you as a mom should actually think, okay, like that was a win. They didn't touch it. Or maybe they played with it. Maybe they smelled it, chewed on it, spit it out. They are so close. And so you just have to kind of man the course because it's going to happen. And there might be a couple nights where like your kid just eats the crackers and asks for more crackers and you have to make a decision like, okay, am I going to say yes or no? But the idea is that you're offering them two choices. Like one is a processed food or not. You could also do like another fresh option, whatever, something else that they, that you know they already like with something that is fresh that you know that they already like. So obviously you have to be judicious with what you choose. But if you're choosing two things that you know they're going to eat, then the rest is sort of like it doesn't really matter. Like if they have Ritz crackers and strawberries tonight, okay, let's hope that tomorrow they have a really good breakfast, you know? Yeah, so again, perspective and like one meal is not a make it or break it because Mm -hmm. the rest will come in time and you have to... Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's consistency of bringing everything to the table like all the, the of the inconsistency you got to bring all the new stuff to the table constantly mm-hmm. yeah and it's good to get them used to that right like they should start to expect what did mommy make tonight like okay maybe I'll try it maybe I won't but sometimes if you get them to try it they'll eat it and they'll ask for like three more helpings because they actually really like it so you might be surprised you know yeah and you're definitely like playing the long game here this is not you know something that's just gonna like happen overnight and get easier you're really like putting in all this time and energy up front so that your kids will be hopefully more adventurous eaters and choose, you know, the right foods over their entire life. Like this isn't just for, for now, you know, getting them to sleep well at night. It's really like, how do we raise kids that are aware of their bodies that know when they're hungry, when they're full, you know, the other part about all this, and we can kind of get into it is eliminating this hierarchy of food. So I really am an advocate for not creating that hierarchy of food. So like, if you know your kid is going to get a cupcake for dessert because you have it or you're going to throw it away or whatever, then you just put it on their plate and serve it with dinner. Like if you're okay with them eating it and you know you're going to give it to them anyway, like serve it next to their broccoli. Like they'll make their way and they're going to naturally try one and then the other. But like the goal is that they don't understand food to be healthy, unhealthy, good, bad. Like they shouldn't be having that stress. You know, we shouldn't like impose that on them at this age, definitely. So the, my goal is to kind of like make sure that they see that all foods that we offer are created equal. They can have as much or as little as they want. But in order to set up that environment, you really have to be judicious with what you're offering, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to give a different perspective because this is one that okay. in all respect, I am very, very skeptical of. I don't believe all foods are created equally because these are like really processed foods and the sugars that were our bodies, our minds, like evolutionary, evolutionarily, we're not known or meant to take in so like when we give them I feel yes. like they do have this extra addiction part of things where it's like that hit of dopamine when they get that chocolate and mm-hmm. sugar rush that will yeah. mean I want more I want more I want more of that I'm never touching the other mm-hmm. thing and I do believe there's like animal studies on that like animals oh yeah go back absolutely to the good food after they've had the process CRAP and Mm-hmm. you know then it's it's yeah. just a, this is totally. what I'm now bringing like ha- you can't teach a kid mm-hmm. like don't touch they're all foods are yeah. created equal okay so yes I don't think that all foods are created equal in the whole wide world that's what I mean like on your kid's plate 
all the foods that you offer should be created equal, right? In terms of getting them comfortable with trying new things, eating new things, like I don't want you to perseverate over, oh my gosh, they ate six pieces of cauliflower and like they didn't touch their whatever, whatever. Like I just don't want you to get into the nitty gritty of how much of their plate they ate. Because we want to create this environment where whatever they're offered is a fair choice. And by fair choice, I mean, like, you're not offering them, you know, a Twinkie versus apple slices. I think any human being would be hardwired to choose this highly palatable processed food. Um, and so it's sort of like eliminating that as a choice. Like, the, a fair choice would be something like blueberries or strawberries or, you know, cauliflower or broccoli or corn on the cob or baked beans, something like that. Um, so yes, but it's really more about creating that environment where they don't really, they're not really ever subjected to these unfair choices because you're not bringing that stuff into your home or into your kitchen for them. You, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. But I and completely so, agree with you. Like, yes, not all, not all foods are created equal. So I don't want to like, yeah. you know, I don't want that to be the takeaway, but I want you to create an environment for your kids where they feel comfortable eating anything in any amount that you offer because you're not offering them a bunch of C-R-A-P, for lack of a better term, you know? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, this is tough stuff, I have to say. And so, Len, if you add on the plant-based part, because I'd love to learn more about that. In my house, we're not plant-based, but I'm so interested in learning more about this. And it's actually the difficulty level that I perceive it to be is like a huge barrier for why I don't do more of it. Um, like, can you tell me how you get Let's just start with protein. Like, how are you getting protein in, in enough volume? <laughs> protein, I thought you'd never ask. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so everybody asks about protein. So we can start with that. I would say um, it's really all about variety. And I think it's about undoing a lot of what we have learned about, quote unquote, nutrition in our entire lifetime. So a lot of these recommendations for X amount of dairy, X amount of protein have historically been very industry driven. Um, and actually the data behind getting them developed is super political and is not necessarily that well, grounded in science, number one. But on the food pyramid. Anyway, we another, don't have to talk about that. Podcast. So <laughs> that aside, all things aside, let's just look at the data behind how much protein kids actually need. So for their body weight, you know, it's a, it's a weight-based requirement. So like for an adult, the, the percentage of your body weight in protein that you need every day is actually a lower percentage than it is for kids. But kids are so tiny that even though the percentage per body weight is higher, the total grams that they need in one day is so much lower. Like for a kid that's four years old, so my son, for example, needs about somewhere around 19 grams of protein a day. So for him, we use this product called Just Egg that's like a vegan scrambled egg. It's really good. It's actually derived from a mung bean. And the nutrition content on it is identical to a real chicken egg but it doesn't have any of the saturated fat or cholesterol. Um, and it's also not gonna you know, contribute to like allergen exposure and stuff like that. So that's what he eats for breakfast. And I think two servings of that, which is what he eats easily, is already something like 20 grams of protein. Like he, you know, he's getting the majority of it through that. But also, what like- is, What's two servings literally on a plate? Two servings of that? Yeah, like what does that mean? Two spoonfuls? Like Oh, I mean like two servings per- whatever. And maybe it's not even that high. I should back up. Like, I think, I mean, I could Google it, but I think a serving of that is like the same as whatever one egg is. Like the nutritional content of that particular product is identical to having one egg. If you have, I don't know what a serving is technically. Oh, it just you. You're on what's saying on they're that. equal to each other. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Like, the, yeah, it was a product that was designed to like basically to be exactly like an egg. So one serving is exactly like an egg, but no cholesterol or saturated fat. So there's that. But let's just say like a peanut butter sandwich or something. That's like, if you put it on a really good piece of sprouted bread, it's like six or eight grams also. Um, or if I give him a smoothie and I want to put protein powder in it, then he's going to get another five or six grams there. So like, it's really easy. It's not actually that hard. Um, if you consider the fact that like 99% of people are getting enough protein, I mean, you or I have never, I've never seen true like protein malnutrition in my whole career ever. <laughs> Yeah. So like over, they did a study. So there was a study looking at eating patterns in the U.S. and they compared like all different eating habits basically. And they found that over 90% of people are getting enough protein every day. There was no difference between vegans or carnivores, but 70% of people are actually getting double the daily recommended requirement for protein. And so I did this 
like I love experimenting like this on my kids. And so I, there's this program called chronometer where you can go in, it's totally free and you can track all your calories. You just make an account and you can plug it in for any age and any weight. So I like did it for my son, whatever. And he was like, right, like up with everybody else in America getting twice his daily requirement of protein. So I think yeah, it's a misconception a little bit. We're all but just eating so much that we're probably everything. So yeah. And everything is fortified. <laughs> and the other thing that I think we have to remember is that your kids are hardwired to know what they need. And so if you eliminate these hyper palatable foods that are like really going to dysregulate that whole system, if you don't really expose them to those, then you can kind of preserve this beautiful like auto regulation that babies are innately born with. They're, they know when they're hungry and they know when they're not. I mean, baby, you know, neonatology, like babies cry when they're hungry they won't eat if they're full. And that's sort of the system that, that we all come with at birth that somewhere along the way kind of gets lost and diluted down. And so um, my goal is to really like tune into when your kids are hungry, when they're, when they're full, let them quit. Don't make them take like that one extra bite. Don't incentivize them to have dessert. Like just listen to them. And if they're hungry, they have to eat. And if they're full, they can stop. So that's kind of just, you know, it's like always just yeah. sort of letting go. And that's the hardest thing I think is a mom anyway. Yeah, I think that that sounds very ideal. And like, if if anyone can maintain that, that's awesome. I think what's so difficult about this probably, you know, separately is just as I get older, you can't mm -hmm. have as much control over that high pro that process, the snacking. So it's, it's the chips, mm -hmm. it's whatever's in the cabinet that you can manage to like, I don't know, at least for me, I do as best as I can, but they still will go to their friend's house. And then if they don't have mm -hmm. it at home, I mean, I've had this happen. My kids just engorge themselves with whatever snacks are at their friend's house. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you created that terrible relationship, which is like, I don't know. It's like, you're always trying your best, but you know, something always, the other shoe drops where it's like, I never give them that. So they've grown up super healthy and they never mm -hmm. had that. Mm -hmm. And yet then they, they are exposed to it and they go bananas and eat it all and want it all. And now it's all they talk about mm -hmm. and that's all they want in the house. And then I don't hear about it. I don't ever stop hearing about it. It just mm -hmm. gets harder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's super hard. And I think the thing is, number one, I think you should stand by your guns. So if they go do that at their friend's house, like, I don't know, all you can do is apologize and maybe like replace the food that they ate, but I don't know. <laughs> but like I, the thing that I tell myself is like, I can only control what I can control. So like we can only buy the food that we're ready to serve at our house if we go out to a friend's house or we go to a party and our kids, you know, want to try something like eventually they're going to have to make all of their own food decisions anyways. So I would just kind of like lean into natural consequences. Like, Oh, you ate all that. Like, I bet you don't feel very good now. Like, how are you feeling after eating three cans of whatever? But I think, um, I don't know. I think eventually like we have to remember that they're going to grow up and make their own decisions. Um, and all you can do is create that sense of what's normal at your own home and it has to be something that you're comfortable with and so if you're not comfortable with it I just wouldn't wouldn't do it if you don't want to buy something don't buy it like I you know my kids all the time will ask my my older one will be like well why can't I have we go to Whole Foods and he wants a meat stick I'm like well did you bring any money because I'm not buying that and he's like well I don't have any money I'm like well when you have money you can buy yourself a meat stick but I'm not no, buying one like today. The, and the, this is like how kids know how to get you it's like the one thing they ask for at Whole Foods is a meat stick and a plant-based home yeah, I know. They well, know there's no way I'm going to buy him that, but yeah, they do. <laughs> but he also kind of gets, I think he all, he's a Gemini, so he likes to just mess with me anyways, but, uh, um, you know, stand your ground. Like, you know, eventually they're going to really thank you because these are choices that are worth making. They're not always the easiest choices, but I think, you know, creating this sense of normal in your household is like, there is no greater value than that. I mean, like a healthy normal is something that so many people like as adults now are so dysregulated because they never grew up having that. And it's really important. And I think eventually your kids are going to look back and say like, oh, my mom does such a good job, you know? Let's hope. Let's hope they're not on a couch. I'm pretty sure your kids are going to think you're, sugar. you're pretty awesome, Lizzie. No, I think your kids are going to be pretty proud of you. Yeah. I hope. I hope. I think we all hope. Um, all right. Any other pearls of wisdom that we haven't touched upon, whether it be baby led eating, picky eating, plant-based eating that you'd love our listeners to hear about? Gosh, I don't know. I think like anything worth doing a hundred percent of the time is worth doing 5% of the time, you know? So if for people like you, Lindsay, that feel like this is just really overwhelming or it's going to be so hard to like make more of a plant-based shift or like incorporate more plants on the plate, like just trying it sometimes is worth 
trying, even if you're going to do like, you know, meatless Monday, or you're just going to say like, all right, I'm going to pack a plant-based lunch like three times this week or something like that. I think really you have to start somewhere. And I think we all did for, for us, it was like a really long and slow transition that eventually stuck. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, remember that you're like, whoever you are listening, I mean, you're the best parent for your kids. You're the only parent for your kids. They're going to look up to you no matter what you do. So sometimes these choices are hard to make and sometimes it's really frustrating in the moment, but like, you know, I think zooming out a little bit and allowing your kid a little bit more control can actually go a long way and just give yourself a little grace. So. Absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you for all that wisdom. Thank you so much. Yeah, no. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. To each their own. And I think that's like the most important part about grace and then educating yourself so you can make the best decisions for your kids when it comes to eating. It's like one of the absolute most important things is the building blocks upon which they will grow. And like when you talk about later and you see this endemic of kids who are obese and then prone to diabetes and then prone to Mm -hmm. all the complications that come with it, it's just so disheartening and we they can do better need to do better and that starts with education yeah totally it's like these micro decisions like little tiny decisions that you make over time that really like can affect the long-term health of your whole family so 